The second star system in Star Citizen is just around the corner. But before heading there, it may be a bit overwhelming to navigate our own home system, Stanton. Today I'm going to take you on a tour of all the planets in Star Citizen as of 317. We'll discuss the background and lore of each planetary system, what opportunities you can find at each one, and where you should start for your first time. If you don't have time for the video, I have a full text guide as well as a nifty infographic, both of which are available on my website, spacetomatogaming.com. And if you want to get real deep, I also posted a long-form, real-time tour of the locations on my second YouTube channel. Make sure to stick around till the end of the video to find out how you could win a Polaris as well. Thank you for coming to my Tomato Talk. It may seem a bit ironic, but one of the most defining features of a space sim is how it handles planets. As a space game, Star Citizen manages to offer a very unique experience, and arguably the best experience regarding this fundamental feature. Let's start with the most basic characteristic, their size. Each planet in Star Citizen is built at a one-tenth scale to their real lore measurements. This also applies to the distances between objects in space. In terms of distance, this was mainly done to properly build a sense of size and investment in your travel decisions while not completely separating the various parts of the star system. As for the planets, there are some serious gameplay implications tied to this choice. A truer scale would mean we'd have to increase the speeds of ships, which would have a lot of knock-on effects. It also means more wasted space on these planets that needs to be rendered during exploration. Meanwhile, moons are built at one-sixth scale to their lore measurements, and stars are an exact one-to-one -one replica. This makes a big difference when you explore the various parts of a system. Stars can look massive in the sky on planets closer to the center, or very small on the more distant locations. And the view you get when exploring the various places can look amazing due to the way developers chose to do this. Each moon and planet you visit will also have a completely unique atmosphere, and it's not just for show. The atmospheric composition will define how long you can survive without a helmet. The local temperature extremes may require you don your survival gear for any excursions that might take you from the safety of your ship. Different gravity levels will change the way you perform and drive after landing. Every ship handles differently based on the density of the atmosphere and how much drag and lift your ship generates, and different types of weather will impact your travels depending on the climate that you're in. All of this isn't even touching on the man-made differences between planets. Each planet has a history that explains how it got to where it is. A city planet teeming with life. A gas giant sporting its own floating city. A frozen world created by a terraforming disaster. And a barren wasteland stripped of resources and dignity after decades of weapon testing and manufacturing. Each location has different advantages based on their government, local biomes, and criminal activity. And the laws you abide by can differ ever so slightly based on some of those same things. This does not change much in our first system, but as the game is built out, you'll want to keep an eye on your reputation and the local laws to make sure you aren't stepping on any toes. Finally, you'll want to keep in mind where each planet you are looking at is located. In Star Citizen, you fly fast in quantum travel with the official max speed being 20% of the speed of light, but it can still take some time to get to your destination. So if you're a bounty hunter or a mercenary, you may want to consider a different home from that miner or cargo hauler. Even though the planets are not moving along their orbits yet, this can still complicate your plans quite a bit when you consider fuel consumption and inventory management. If you aren't familiar with this idea of a home, I'll make sure to link some resources down below. But just think of your home as your default storage location. This is where all your belongings and ships will start out and where new things will be delivered. It is not the same as your regeneration point which can be moved much more easily. Now, with a little more background regarding how these planets differ from one another, let's take a look at our choices. If you took the monolithic, dystopian nightmare that is Blade Runner's Los Angeles and kitbashed it with Star Wars Coruscant, you might get something like Arcorp. Star Citizen is all about the sci-fi tropes, and the city planet was a surprisingly early one to be tackled. 
In fact, on that point, this whole star system is quite unique in the amount of and variety in the landing zones that we are discussing today. Building this entire planet worth of buildings subsequently really helped build out the utilitarian building style for future planets. While you can't explore the whole planet on foot, many of those buildings can be landed on, and some are even used for delivery missions. The main landing area, Area 18, is a beautiful area to fly around with a lot of variety and detail in the buildings. Given how low you can fly, it's definitely worth cruising through these streets for a bit if your computer can handle it. Besides the amazing views though, Arcorp doesn't have much to offer currently. There is no explorable land, which means no derelicts, outposts, bunkers, caves, or other points of interest besides cities to visit. That being said, the planet does have two moons, Walla and Lyria, which do have their own outposts, though they are quite cold. Arcorp is not the best place for the explorer. Instead, with missions like the boarding action mission, plenty of moon bunkers to raid, and a bustling mining hub not too far away at the Arcorp L1 Lagrange point, this location is best for miners, mercenaries, bounty hunters, and pirates. The stores in the city are also some of the best in the game. With stores covering all your buying needs, you won't find yourself out of luck if you load in for the day with different gameplay in mind. Arcorp might not be the best starting point due to a fairly limited experience considering all Star Citizen has to offer, but it is a great destination nonetheless. Hurston is dirty. From a distance, it looks like a ball of dust. From above, it looks like a close-up ball of dust. And from within, it looks like the inside of a plastic bag. Literally, the air quality can get so bad, some residents just wear plastic bags on their head. The rulers of this planet are unbelievably all about themselves and don't really care much for the citizens. On top of that, they're incredibly controlling to the point you can't buy more than a pistol at a store within a million kilometers of this city. This was the first planet added to the game in 2018, and puts on a good display of the different biomes and atmosphere a planet can have. You'll find everything from savannas to coastlines to wastelands filled with trash on this planet, and you'll still have plenty to see. There are bunkers, outposts, caves, ruins, and all kinds of geography to explore with ground vehicles a distinct benefit only available to two planets right now. Hurston is also the only planet with four distinct moons for you to visit and explore, each with different color palettes, atmospheres, and surrounding asteroid fields with their own activities. One of these moons actually houses the only prison in the star system as well. This is where certain level player criminals who are caught by security or bounty hunters will be kept serving their sentence. For this very reason, and the general corruption surrounding the Hurston family and their business, You'll find quite a few pirate bounties in the Hurston area. Overall, Hurston offers some of the best gameplay potential in the game so far. Bounty hunters will benefit from increased pirates. Cargo haulers can find good supply outposts on the moons. Mercenaries can raid bunkers to their heart's content. Miners can find plenty of deposits for their grey cat rocks. Explorers can seek out plenty of places to visit and discover points of interest. And pirates, well they can hunt all of them. Aside from the lack of weapons that don't have the Hurston name written on them, because again, that's just how the family is, you'll be able to gear up with the bare necessities in the Hurston area. And with the new addition of clouds to the planet, you're sure to get a pretty full experience starting here on Hurston. I would recommend it to new players and veterans alike. In fact, I would put Hurston at a close second behind Microtech for my top choice for new players. A gas giant. We haven't even gotten past the first star system and these people went and made an explorable gas giant. As I said, this system allows the team to really get stuck in with their tools before expanding the game. And this one required a lot of tools. The last planet in the system to visit was also the first we could see. Crusader has been in game since 2015, but was always a static asset. Now players can dive into the clouds and visit the floating city of Orison, where Crusader Industries, owner of the planet, builds the very spaceships players can buy in-game. 
Offering some of the best views in the game, Orison is actually the only place you can land on the whole planet, making it the least interactive one in the whole system. But it will also seemingly be the only one where capital ships will be able to dock, if you're needing that kind of thing. Given there are no distinct biomes or locations to visit outside of the city, at least until space whales are in the game, we look to the three moons for the fun. This is really where Crusader shines, too. Crusader looks absolutely massive in the sky when you're on these moons. Being the oldest sector of the game, this is also where some more unique features shine through. These include the pirate base where you can respawn, as it's the only pirate-friendly landing zone in the whole game right now. The only planetary asteroid belt in the system is here, where that base is located. The original Port Olisar space station, a relic of the past with its easy access landing pads and lack of a respawn center. A very interesting narrative-driven investigation mission, the only space-bound location where you can reset your criminal level, and a couple more things that I won't spoil for you. Those are in addition to a number of bunkers, outposts, and caves offering gameplay options. This area is great for the pirate due to their base, explorers for the unique features, players looking for new missions, bounty hunters, couriers, and rock miners looking for better weather than Hurston's more hot moons. You'll also have access to all the supplies you need at Orison's stores. All that being said, there are some things that make Crusader a subpar new player experience. I would highly recommend spending your valuable time in this area, but maybe not on your first trip to the verse. The Frozen World Distant from the star and ruined by a malfunction in the terraforming process, the isolated Microtech finds itself the best location for new players, in my opinion. Let's start with the basics. Microtech is home to some vastly differing biomes, all ranging from incredibly cold freeze you to death in minutes, to incredibly cold but also quite beautiful. Microtech's primary landing zone is New Babbage, which is essentially Apple City in the future. The company actually manufactures Star Citizen equivalent to the smartphone, a wrist-mounted augmented reality display that takes care of almost all of your needs, known as the Moby Glass. The planet of Microtech is not necessarily so warm and inviting, though. Traveling around Microtech will have you running into regular blizzards, tons of bunkers and outposts, and caves that can be walked and flown into. The planet is also consistently used as a testbed for new planetary tech, such as the new volumetric cloud layer. So you'll be able to find the first river in-game on this planet, likely as well as the first fauna, once it's ready. While not as inviting as Orison, New Babbage holds its own in terms of attractiveness, both in amenities and atmosphere. The city is very reminiscent of current-day tech hubs, but also offers plenty of weapons, clothes, and ship components. Personal armor is not easy to come by, though, and the city layout can be a bit more confusing than Lorville. But mission content is in a good place, with plenty of mercenary, courier, and investigation missions available. As well as a couple of suggested money makers for newcomers, the illegal monitors detected and boarding action in progress missions. While mining opportunities aren't the best out here, the lack of valuable mining routes adds on top of the safety you're already getting from the distance to the rest of the system. Besides the beautiful planet of Microtech, there are also three moons in the area. Cleo, Calliope, and Euterpe. All three are just about as cold as their planet with varying atmospheres. While you'll find bunker missions around these moons, the cargo haulers will get the real benefits out here, with fairly valuable cargo both legal and illegal. While there are some career paths that won't fare well out here at Microtech, I do recommend it as the best place for new players to start out, and one of the best starting spots for many others as well. This guide is only half the story, as there are plenty of things to keep in mind with these planets, and plenty of changes coming to each one as the R&D teams complete their work. We've seen this with the gradual addition of clouds to each planet, building interiors expected to greatly expand missions in cities, the new river added to Microtech, rock arches, canyons, and many other small additions that have been discussed. Star Citizen is a constantly changing game with a long road ahead of it. 
So while this guy may help you choose home now, make sure to subscribe to the channel so you can always be up to date on your choices. And check out my guides and tutorials playlist to get more help on different aspects of the game moving forward. I'm always working to fill it with new and updated guides for you. And thank you for watching this video. Guides and tutorials are difficult to make due to the changing nature of this alpha, but with the first set of planets all but done, I hope this can help players for a while. As I said, if you'd like more guides, news, and feature deep dives into this game at the highest quality, make sure to subscribe here and check out my second channel, Space Tomato 2, where I post more casual content like my podcast and other game content. And if you're here, maybe you've heard about my giveaway coming up. I've left a code for you right here for anybody still watching as a thank you for your support. The giveaway will be starting in the next week. So keep that code handy and enter it when prompted for a better chance at winning one of several ships totaling over $1,000 in value. Finally, if you'd like to help fund this content for the Star Citizen community, consider Patreon, Ko-fi, or YouTube membership to help support my family. In addition, you'll also receive exclusive videos every month at higher quality. Whatever you decide to do, I hope you learned something in this video, and I'll catch you in the next.